Welcome to our video on sizing precast concrete spanning members. This one is going to focus on double T's and L beams. So if we look in the precast manual, we see a series of pages that look like this. This is the general shape of a double T. Uh, they're made in various widths from 8 to 10 to 12 to 15 feet. 15 feet is fairly hard to transport down the road. Typically has to be set at an angle on the truck. Um, but for certain applications where you want to cover large areas and do it in the most economical way, a 15 foot wide, um, double T is appropriate. Uh, the set of tables we're going to be looking at right now happen to be 12 foot wide. So that's from this edge to that edge. Um, the ribs, this one and this one, are set in three feet from the ends. So in when these things are finally assembled side by side, the spacing of these ribs is equal. In this case, it would be six feet, which is half the width of the overall panel. <clears throat> so here's that 12 foot dimension and the six feet from center line to center line of the ribs. There's a uh, so-called chamfer here, which um, makes it easier to remove it from the mold. It reduces stress concentration and improves the shear transfer between uh, the tension that's at the bottom of the rib due to the steel and the compression that exists primarily in this flange. Now we're going to do a blow up of this. Um, so we're just looking at that same page, except we're looking more closely um, so that you can read it better. You'll notice that the vertical dimension or the depth of the structure is listed at 28. So in this case, there's a two inch flange on the top of the precast element. That precast element is roughed up and has uh, steel loops coming out of it so that on the site, those steel loops can be used to pick it up, by the way. And then on the site, two inches of topping is applied. Now that two inch topping is really crucial because these double T's almost never come to an extremely high level of precision. They have an inherent camber in them due to the pre-stressing operation. So the steel is stretched, the concrete is cast, and then when the uh, hydraulic elements that have stretched the steel are released. The tension in the steel causes camber or a rise at the center of the double T. <clears throat> um, so we have to smooth out some of that camber, but also the double T's are never uh, cambered to exactly the same height. So there will be little edges where the two members meet. If you tried to put carpet down on that, the carpet would become quickly damaged, but people could even stub their toes on the slight irregularities from one panel to the other. So the topping layer is a way of smoothing all that out in the field to give a satisfactory finished floor. <clears throat> um, this particular double T has the following designation. Uh, 12 is the 12 foot width. DT stands for double T. The 28 is the depth, the structural depth in inches. And then the plus two means that there's a topping on it. And you'll notice that it, this is, this particular table is for normal weight concrete double T's with a two inch normal weight topping. The topping, ironically enough, we almost always pick to be normal weight um, because the camber that was induced in the beam um, is kind of problematical in terms of the shape of the beam and we're actually looking for useful dead weight to help take some of that camber out. So normally these tables will give two inch normal weight topping which is what gets delivered to the site to create this extra two inch layer on the top. Now I'm going to flick down and just point out that uh, there's a lightweight version of this uh, it still has a normal weight topping, and that's in this table right here. <clears throat> For the moment, we're not going to be too concerned about which of those we use. 
um, but we want to step through the rest of these tables and understand what the tables are about and then we'll come back to that issue. All right, so up in the upper left hand side here we have something called the strand pattern. Um, the first number or the first two digits is the number of strands. Um, in this case there are 16 of them. Um, 8 is the diameter of the strands in sixteenths of an inch. So eight sixteenths would be half inch diameter cable. And then there's either an S or a D. If it's S it means the steel is pulled straight everywhere. Um, if there's a D it means that it's depressed. And what we mean by that is we might have the steel coming to the top of the rib or near the top of the rib at the ends and then being pushed downward so that it's near the bottom of the rib at center span. And in fact we can have a D1 which is depressed just at the center span or we can have a D2 which has two depression points uh, roughly near the quarter points. Generally speaking though the industry discourages you from using depressed strand because it costs extra money to perform that operation of pushing the steel down uh, to make that shaping of the steel and it's a non-trivial thing when you've got a steel cable that's stressed at 170,000 pounds per square inch it's not easy to reshape that through the use of force. Uh, so generally speaking those are, are uh, measures that we'd like to avoid if possible but you can have a D1 or a D2 uh, depending on the number of depressions that uh, are called for. So we're going to uh, try to think in terms of how we might use this material to frame out uh, an office building. We've talked about the fact that office buildings are um, designed to 80 pounds a square foot in the actual offices spaces, 100 pounds a square foot in any corridor space, We've mentioned that it's probably a good idea if you're designing a spec building and you don't even know where the corridors are going to get laid out to uh, design for 100 pounds a square foot of live load. Um, some people think that just doing that without uh, at least looking where the uh, circulation patterns might be and understanding what the possibilities are is a mistake. In our case, we're going to we're going to say that. Um, well, I should mention the fact that in the code uh, it is possible for large enough areas of floor for you to not design for the full load on the grounds that the probability is that you'll never load the entire floor up to that point. A double T that's say 12 feet wide and 60 feet long would certainly qualify as a substantial amount of floor area which would allow us to reduce the load. So right for the moment just for discussion purposes we're going to target something in the range of 80 to 100 pounds a square foot of imposed live load. Now having said that let's look at this table. Um, these, this is normal weight concrete. This is the intended span in feet and we're going to target about 60 feet and the reason we're interested in that is that uh, 60 feet is not a bad width for an office building in that it allows you to get a fair amount of floor area per unit area of um, envelope that you have to pay for while at the same time keeping the building narrow enough that you can get pretty good access to daylight and to views. So it's possible to design a 60 foot wide building where 15 feet in from each of the major facades you get basically 100% daylighting. For the 30 feet of the core you get roughly half your lighting needs and with the proper layout you can make sure that everyone in that building has good views of the outside in at least one direction and often two. So we're going to kind of look at 60 feet as a reasonable number to go after. 60 feet is also interesting because that's the width of space that we typically design to for double loaded uh, parking. So if we wanted to have parking under this building a 60 foot free span would also be good 
And in fact, you may notice from your experience in life that double T's are extensively used in parking deck applications. So this technology easily spans up to the order of 56 to, 50 to 60 feet. So if we look at 60 feet as our target span and we say, okay, we're going for 80 or 100 pounds a square foot, when we scan down here for these 28 inch deep members, we have to go down to a 188 D1. So this is 18 strands of 8 16 inch cable or half inch cable. There's one depression at the center and we're able to get 85 pounds a square foot of superimposable load. This is the table of safe superimposed lo loads in pounds per square foot. And it also gives cambers. So one of the things I should note right here is that this table doesn't bother with factored loads. It doesn't even burden you with worrying about dead loads or the self weight of the structure. They have organized their tables in terms of safe superimposed service load. So these are very user friendly tables. I'm saying I'm targeting somewhere around a 80 or 100 pounds a square foot. And I look down here and it says 85, which says I can safely superimpose 85 pounds a square foot, which would probably be perfectly satisfactory for this design. The one thing that I'm looking at is this D1. And I know already from reactions I've gotten previously from the precast industry, if they can avoid doing that depression, they would like to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump up in this table and we're going to go to uh, a deeper beam. Before I do that, by the way, I, I do want to mention the following. This topping is field applied. It's the poorest quality concrete. They get much more, much better quality concrete in the factory environment. So the double T itself is superior to that topping. And that topping often has freeze thaw problems uh, in parking decks during winter time. So the precast industry makes what they call a pre-topped, which is a really bizarre term. It merely means that it comes out with a four inch flange instead of a two inch flange and there's no intention of putting a topping on it in the field. So the connection between the two occurs due to welded uh, embeds uh, at the connection between one of these and the adjacent one. Um, and that's why in parking decks you can often walk along them and maybe even see daylight through the cracks. And you do have irregular, irregular uh, surface issues where two of these meet each other, but typically we put up with that in parking decks on the grounds that people are going to be a little more careful there. We're not putting carpet down. They're not going to trip on it. Uh, we're not going to damage the carpet. Um, and mainly it's tires rolling over those joints. So the irregularity of the joints is not an issue. So this 30 inch pre-topped is basically made in the same forms that the 28 inch with the topping is, except that they, they uh, pour a, an extra two inches um, when they're in the process of forming this double T. So they call this a pre-topped double T and in general the concrete involved in it is of a superior grade. <clears throat> All right, so now uh, to explore further what our options are in terms of avoiding that depressing of the steel strand, we can go to the so-called 32 inch and I'm going to zoom in on that so that you can see it better. The overall structural depth is four inches more than the 28, but otherwise it's something identical. And now uh, when we look down here and we're scanning at 60 feet, if we want 82 pounds a square foot, or over 80 rather, we can settle for this 82, which is a 188S. So S means straight, there's no depression. There are 18 strands of 8 16 cable, or in other words, half inch cable. And so, uh, in order to avoid the depression and still achieve our uh, 80 pounds a square foot of superimposable load, um, we're going to go with the 32 inch deep double T. 
So this is what our building might look like. It's uh, unbelievably simple. We have columns on the left-hand side here, which we hope is a south-oriented wall um, because we're assuming that this is a building that's 60 feet wide in its narrow direction and it's long in the direction that we're looking in. And uh, so we're spanning 60 feet from side to side. These are, this, is, this facade and that facade will be our major facades and we'd like to orient them north and south for thermal and daylighting reasons, although that's not absolutely necessary. In this case, we have double T's, which have been drawn two feet, 10 inches deep. That's the 34 inches that we end up with uh, for the overall depth of the, um, of the double T with the topping. So we have a topping on top of here, and then we have the regular two inch of flange. And this is the lower edge of the double T. So the double T is spanning from there over to there, and there's a 60 foot free span uh, between the two columns, which should have been shown in this drawing, but isn't. Then there are some uh, spandrel girder beams that tie into the columns. So here are the columns. Those are the cut section of the spandrel beams. They are supporting the ends of the double T's. And in this case, I've shown a hung ceiling here and then boxed out some sort of a duct trunk line down the center of the building. So air would come in a supply and go up and between the ribs in feeder ducts. Um, there might be a supply and return in this trunk line, in which case some of the spaces between the ribs would be for supply feeder ducts and, and then the plenum volume between could be used for the return. Or if this ceiling is low enough, this can be the return volume and it can be just a plenum over the top of the building. Another option, of course, is if we have a really open plan in the building, we can return through the occupied spaces. But as soon as you start introducing walls for private offices and things like that, you start to need a plenum volume for the return air. So you have an unbelievably simple building. It consists of a series of columns spandrel beams or, or girder beams, and then double T's spanning the full 60 foot width of the building. Now, there are two problems with this design. Um, one is you still have to enclose the ends of these double T's, so you're going to need some kind of facade structure going up here. The second and larger problem from my point of view is that you're, you're not getting very good daylight because this spandrel beam is blocking the light. You're getting good views down towards the ground, but for most buildings, that's not your prime view down towards the ground. If this were a super high-rise building or something, that would be a, a different kind of market from what we're sort of envisioning here. But the dilemma is uh, this spandrel beam is getting in the way of our daylight. So we'd like to talk about how, what we can do about that. And one of the things we can do is we can incorporate something called an L-beam. And that looks something like the following. So this is what that table looks like. Uh, this is what it looks like blown up. So a typical dimension here might be one foot in that direction with a large degree of variability in terms of H. And by the way, in this table, they show H going from 20 to 60, but that 60 feet is not uh, a limit. They just wanted to put some limit on their table. So that number could go higher if you wanted it to. So for a one foot rectangular beam, we put this ledger piece out and it is extended eight inches in order to provide a seat for the double T's to sit on. And then the depth of this is eight inches in order to allow you to get some steel stirrups in there in order to assure that this ledger is properly engaged with the rectangular beam. So this eight inch extension and at least eight inches of depth um, are two uh, crucial uh, characteristics of this type of beam. So the nice thing about this beam is instead of sitting totally underneath the double T's, 
it actually provides the ledger for the double T's to sit on and then the spandrel beam goes and encloses the ends of the double T's and also uh, um, uh, can go much higher for structural reasons. So um, the set of tables typically are in pretty coarse units. You can have a one foot dimension here or in this case a, a one foot six inch dimension um, in order to uh, get a sturdier beam here basically. So these tables tell you the allowed loads. For the moment though rather than focus on sizing these beams I think we want to go look at what this looks like architecturally. So here we have um, an L-beam with its 8-inch extension and an 8-inch deep um, ledger. Sitting on top of that is our 60-foot long double T. Uh, this is the lower edge of that double T right here. And this is the hung ceiling. So there's the edge of the double T and it sits on top of the L-beam. In this case, I brought the L-beam up 2 feet 6 inches, which is the height of what we call the work plane. That's the typical height for a desk surface. I generally don't like to bring the spandrel beam up any higher than that because it starts to shade the desktop. So right at the point where you'd expect to have the best daylight or the most ample daylight right next to the window, you can end up with a shadow line. So generally, I would try to never bring this up more than three feet and two feet six inches is about right. Now, when we count for, account for the overall 34 inch depth of the double T and the eight inch depth of the ledger and then this two and a half feet uh, of material up above the uh, finished surface, the overall depth of the spandrel beam is six feet. Now that's an extremely deep and extremely efficient building um, beam and it also has the advantage that it provides an automatic backing for whatever surfacing you're going to use uh, to comp insulate and waterproof the building. So what we've ended up with is if we put this ceiling at the lower, line it up with the lower edge of this L-beam, um, we end up with an 11 foot 2 inch ceiling which is really excellent from a daylighting point of view. This is for a 14 foot 8 inch floor to floor dimension which is a pretty conventional and reasonably conservative dimension there. Um, and, and because uh, we're able to still get this dimension of 11 foot 2 inches for the clearance of the ceiling uh, it turns out to be pretty economical to span this 60 feet and to put up with this depth of 2 feet 10 inches, which is, uh, in other words, we had to go to something about that deep in order to span this full 60 feet. Um, but we don't seem to be disturbed by it too much because our floor-to-floor -floor dimension is still pretty reasonable and our ceiling is really high, so we're able to get daylight in really well. Another thing we can do here is we will have some framing due to the glass, which is at least two inches deep, maybe three. It's sometimes nice to just go ahead and lower the ceiling so it lines up with that framing. That eliminates any shadow line and sort of suppresses uh, your awareness of the glass uh, because your eye can follow the, ceil the ceiling line all the way out into the outside world without sort of psychologically stumbling on that frame which creates that sort of heavy uh, dark shadow line. So there we have an incredibly simple structural system no interior columns 60 foot span excellent daylighting wonderful ceiling height uh, very practical floor to floor dimension really deep structural members which are going to be structurally very efficient and rugged um, and it's it's really a, an inexpensive form of construction. That ends our first video on sizing precast concrete spanning members focusing on double T's and L beams.